Thank you, Frank. Thanks to the organizers, and uh, thanks to all of my excellent collaborators. I have um, five specifically on the piece of software that I'm going to talk about today. We decided to name it Bertini Real because it's for computing real things using Bertini. Uh, so, um, let's see. So, I'm going to talk today about that which we've called Bertini Real. Um, it's a compiled command line software, so it's not called from Bertini, but it's a separate um, compiled piece of software. Um, and uh, it is an almost purely numerical software package um, that does a little bit of symbolic stuff that produces uh, a cellular decomposition of um, the real algebraic component, and there's a parenthesis around the S right there, of your choosing of um, the complex parts of an algebraic variety. Um, it's intimately connected uh, to Bertini, um, as the name suggests, in the sense that Bertini Real uses the homotopy continuation engine um, that's from Bertini. Uh, and um, that's because there's adaptive multiple precision um, and a plethora of settings that uh, are amenable to the computations that I do. Um, for the few symbolic computations I do, um, I issue commands to MATLAB. Um, I'll show you uh, instances where I make those um, by doing deflation, and I've written visualization routines and post-processing in MATLAB. Um, it, Bertini Real currently will decompose curves and surfaces, dimensions uh, 1 and 2. Um, uh, so far, I've done um, dimension 20 curves and um, dimension 8 surfaces, and um, if I can overcome my own um, coding ignorance, I'll be able to push those bounds even higher. Yeah. So by dimension 20 curve, you need a curve in 20 dimensional space. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, John coded the isosingular <laughs> deflation in MATLAB, and so so I call MATLAB. Um, and I would like to move entirely away from anything that's closed source and costs money. So I'd like to use uh, like SymPy as a replacement for that, because then I can give you my software, and you don't have to have MATLAB or Maple to run it. Um, one thing that I'm going to end with uh, today is that I want to show you um, how I've had some uh, fun success in a neat application of um, the decomposition that I produce, which is um, in the world of uh, 3D printing. So I brought some results. Okay, so uh, we're all about uh, setting up the notation for what we're going to do. So I'm like, okay, F, just like y'all are doing, uh, polynomial system. I'm going to assume I've got real coefficients, and I'm going to map from capital N to little n. V is the variety, as it always is. I'm going to talk about component C um, being a uh, component of the variety. Its dimension is K. Um, and if F happens to be overdetermined, um, that is to say that the difference between capital N and little n is not K, then I'm just going to replace F. I'm going to forget about this one, and I'm going to replace it with a randomized version of itself so that in all the computations that follow, I get square systems. Uh, which is certainly necessary. Uh, and so my objective is to decompose the real part of that complex component. So my computations are going to happen over the complex numbers, but I'm going to find the real stuff um, by uh, putting my, my real number blinders on. When you say randomized version of itself, you mean just to twiddle all the coefficients mm -hmm. by some random amount? I'm going to take um, random combinations of the polynomials in a sensible way uh, so that I get a new system that's square, has all of the information of the original polynomials with the incurred cost of um, periodically having to make sure that the solutions I found are actually solutions and not junk from randomization. You have a non-complete intersection, yeah. like the rational normal curve. Well, that's what he's referring to. So, so his rational normal curve would have, would have some random secant line on it. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a standard term called squaring up, I guess. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm going to tell you about curves, and I'm going to do that first because then I'm going to use the curve stuff to decompose surfaces, um, and then I'll talk to you a bit more about some specific polynomial systems and how I solve those, as that is the focus of this week's workshop. Okay, so I'm going to produce a, um, a cellular decomposition, and uh, both a, a curve and surface decomposition are cellular decompositions. A curve is decomposed into one cells, where one is the dimension, and we call those edges. Um, a, uh, an edge is given in the dark blue um, on the screen here. It, it consists of 
two boundary points. We're calling them left and right. If you just turn your head sideways on this line here, you can go left and right. Um, uh, the edge is equipped with a midpoint, which happens to be generic. Um, I also need to know something about the projection pi. Um, and uh, when the points, particularly the midpoint, the left point, and the right point, are coupled with um, the projection, as well as the original system which generated the edge, or the cell, um, I get the equipment I need to be able to arbitrarily sample the uh, cell by moving around the midpoint in terms of the projection value. So initially you want to make a random linear coordinates? We're going to solve the problem by choosing uh, a random set of real projections. Yeah. So general position is equivalent to um, choosing random projections. And it's nicer that way because that way I don't have to muck with the uh, uh, original equations. I can just do everything in terms of the cor uh, coordinates of the projection. What does it mean a cell is there? I beg your pardon? What does it mean this? What's, what's the relation with the curve and this picture? So um, we ask your question one more time. Please, which is the relation with the curve and your picture? The, um, the, the curve is like floating around behind here. So it's, um, this is an extremely coarse representation of the curve. So I'm going to capture the topological information of the curve. And, um, and I'll just get this chunky representation. And the point of using this nice representation is not only do I have points, but also a homotopy that I can use to recover the nice smooth representation of the curve. Yeah. So, so you, can, you can sample an arc of the curve. Yeah. by moving your middle point and fixing <coughs> the right and the left points in your curve. That's right. I think he just slides the... Well, can I guess, so Alicia's question was, what about the higher dimensional cells? So what do you mean by two cell? Is it a regular two cell or is it just homeomorphic to the open ball? I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so, so because, because, I, because I, in order to talk about a two cell, I have to get through the, the one cell stuff. So I'm going to get through the one cell stuff and the decomposition. Here's how I produce the road map of, of the curve. I'm like, okay, so we chose our random projections, and that's, what I'm, that's like f fundamental to the decomposition. Choose those projections and fix them throughout this. Uh, it's a dimension one object, so one projection. And then I'm like, okay, let's find the critical points with respect to that projection. Uh, in this case, I find two. Uh, I, you know, like before I solve the system, I have no idea how many to expect. And then I say, uh, okay, I've got these points here. So let's take the centroid of those points right there. Let's take three times the distance from the central point to the outermost critical point that I found. Um, triple that. Take a sphere of that radius centered about those things with the center right there intersect that with the curve and obtain that point and that point. That's going to capture the divergent behavior of the curve as it goes off to infinity. It's possible that its in intersection is empty if the curve happens to be um, real compact. So now I have essentially where all of the interesting stuff happens. It happens where the curve goes uh, critical with respect to the random projection and where the um, curve has more or less infinite behavior, the intersection with the sphere. So I take these blue points, use my random projection, and project them onto um, a position irrelevant uh, copy of the real line. And I get these blue checks right there. Then I take an average of those. This is kind of what I think of as downstairs. And I obtain the red checks. Now I take and do um, a linear slice move and obtain a slicing of the curve above each of these midpoint projection points. And I get these red points right here. So things are starting to pencil in here. So now my objective is to, um, to complete the road map. I've got the generic points in the middle. Those are going to be these red points right here. I've got the endpoints of the edges or at least some of them, the rest have yet to manifest. So then I'm going to take, for each red point, I'm going to track it left and right and see where it goes on that curve. I'm going to use that homotopy that I'm equipped with, which was the um, function for the curve itself. I'm going to track it, and I'm going to see to which of the blue points does it go. Or maybe it doesn't go to a blue point, and it just kind of stops, and it's a point that I haven't encountered before. And I just say, OK, it's a new point and I'm still going to create the edge. 
So I get, as a result of doing that, this um, overly complicated decomposition of this elliptic curve. So, so, so if, you get the, if you get it where it stops, then there was a critical point you didn't detect. No, the critical point in this in this particular picture right here, um, the critical point that I didn't detect that you think I didn't detect are down here, but they lie in the same uh, fiber of the projection as this intersection point with the sphere. No, no, I, I guess what I was saying is, is you follow these red points, yeah. and sometimes you, meet, you get to a blue point. You said sometimes you don't. So if you don't get to a blue point, then then that must mean there's a critical point you didn't detect. It just means that it's in the same fiber as a critical. point. Okay. Yeah, observe. Oh, oh, oh I see. I, 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 now I understand. Okay. Okay. Groovy. So I, I like yeah, so, so these are kind of superfluous points. They shouldn't have shown up. Uh, they're just kind of like these artifacts of the point that in that same fiber there was a legitimate critical point or intersection point. And so as optional step five, if you want to get something that's kind of topologically simple, um, we're going to merge away these guys. I'm going to say, okay, so this guy was new. I remember that. I remember the property that's associated to it, some metadata. And now I can take one of these two points here, doesn't matter which one, track it to halfway between this blue point and this blue point, and simplify this edge so that now I have this cyan edge, this yellow edge, and this one right here. So now I've got a simple one. Again, this step is optional. You can stop right here. Um, and now uh, the part that our eyes really like, or possibly that uh, um, numerical integration over this thing, or maybe optimization likes, is the ability to re refine this curve by sliding around the midpoint of each edge by controlling its projection value. And I can do that so long as I don't attempt to track the midpoint beyond either of the endpoints of the edge on which it lies. And that's a curve decomposition for me. And it works in any computationally feasible dimension. So here's our friend the twisted cubic. This non-merged, overly complicated decomposition has five edges. Right, so I plotted all the points here. Uh, I used an, um, an overdetermined representation of the twisted cubic, too, to show you that it works, even in the case that I use um, something which requires randomization. Now here's a curve. Uh, this is a critical curve of a Chmutov surface, which is um, a sum of uh, Chebyshev polynomials and variables. Um, I like to think of it as Swiss cheese. All right, so here's, a, here's my, my critical curve on my block of Swiss cheese. It's still, it's, it's a three-dimensional curve, so it's, it's not that bad. Um, there are pre-existing algorithms. Okay, and then here's um, the second largest curve that I've decomposed, uh, which Charles showed earlier. Thank you very much for the plug, uh, which is in uh, 14 variables. Um, and the two-dimensional two projection we're viewing right here, degree 128, um, and in an old, um, less optimized version took uh, like 12 hours or something like that to decompose. It wasn't bad. Okay, so now I'm ready to answer your, your question about what the two cell looks like. Okay, so here's um, part of a decomposition. I always like to show it as, as part of a decomposition because by itself it makes less sense. So for me, uh, a two cell consists of a generic midpoint. Always have one of those guys. Why? Because I want to be able to refine this. And then it's got boundary. So it's got a generic point in the middle, a boundary, it's going to have two projections and a system that I can use to sample it. The boundary is going to consist of um, a left edge, which came from a curve decomposition, a right edge. In this case, it was degenerate. The right, mid, and left points of that edge were all the same. And a top and a bottom edge, of which there can be only, only one per top and bottom. And they're all glued together. Does that answer your question about what the two cell looks like? <laughs> In the high dimensions, right? Yes. This is a, a, um, a three-dimensional surface that I'm showing a piece of. And so the red block is one, is one face. I've got another face or another two cell right here. We call, we call our two cells faces. Um, so I've got a yellow one, a blue one, red one. Um, it's easy to get a lot of them under decomposition. So how do, I, how do I produce my cellular decomposition into two cells which contain one cells as boundaries which contain points or zero cells as boundaries? Boundary is a circle, topologically a circle. Yes. Okay, so first I'm going to decompose the critical curve. I'm going to examine, now I have two projections because I'm decomposing a two-dimensional object. Um, so 
I'm going to find where is the surface critical with respect to those two projections, get this critical curve. Um, there may also be singular curves. Anything that's singular is naturally going to appear when you do the critical curve decomposition. In order to do that, I need to lie on John's ISO singular deflation algorithm, and that's where the MATLAB comes in. Um, since Bertini doesn't have symbolics inside of it, I'm like, okay, we'll turn to one of these other guys. So I do an isosingular deflation. So here's the handle of the Whitney umbrella. Boom, pops up, it's deflated. I can track on it. It's decomposed into edges. And okay, then I'm intersecting with the sphere to capture that infinite behavior. I'm going to slice in between all of the critical stuff, and I get um, mid slices like this thin one right here. I get critical slices like the thicker ones. And then I need to connect the dots, connect the midpoints of the face to the midpoints of all the adjoining edges to the left and right. And uh, I call it connect the dots right here. So I get this chunky representation of the Whitney umbrella. And then since I have generic midpoint projections and a homotopy, I can refine it um, ad nauseum. And I get a refined Whitney umbrella. So. Um, it sounded like Frank earlier was curious as to what makes this different. Um, for me, a, a zero-dimensional set like this singular curve is zero-dimensional. Um, it has uh, no um, positive measure to it in the sense that um, a uh, um, bisection method would, where you descend and bound it between boxes. So I can truly detect that zero-dimensional stuff is zero-dimensional. OK, so here's an example of what the torus looks like for me. I get um, eight faces on this guy, where the critical curve are the two boundaries. I've got this uh, still three-dimensional surface. I've got this surface right here, which has two curves of singularity, a self-intersection, and a cusp, where both of those curves happen to go naked for a little while. I've got this four-dimensional surface. We're viewing a, a three-dimensional projection of it. I've got this. Um, three-dimensional projection of a six-dimensional surface. Uh, it's been passed through an arctangent two function in order to obtain a periodic uh, surface. So you could glue the two ends of the worm together and you get kind of this infinite chain of worms. Okay. Um, Did you not mention cells? Do they have any additional properties in, like the, are they cylindrical or? Are they cylindrical? Are they they are um, a breaking up of the surface into um, the, the boundaries, which are critical in terms of the two projections that you've chosen, and regions interior to those which are um, generic and singularity free. Uh, does that answer your question? Well, I know that we have been trying to obtain cellular decomposition of two dimensional surfaces. But Fixed coordinate system, not with random, and it's kind of rather difficult. So I'm thinking where. <laughs> okay. I got uh, a few minutes left here, so I'm gonna place forward. Okay, so I've got. Um, I rely wholly on on the witness set and on the regeneration that Charles talked about earlier today to solve these systems. You're like Dan. Uh, how do you get these blue points that were on the elliptic curve at the beginning? How do you get that critical curve? And I'm like, oh, I just find where the determinant of the Jacobian matrix concatenated with the Jacobian of the random projection, or maybe you chose a special projection. That's an option to the program. Um, Go singular. And then I have some patch equation, uh, which sometimes I write and sometimes I don't. Uh, that one shouldn't have one there. So how do I, how do I solve that? I solve that by um, doing a regeneration to the system on the right right here, and I solve the system on the left. So I've got these um, null vector variables right here. I've got this matrix right here. I've got the patch to make sure I don't just find the zero null vector, which you're not interested in. And I repeatedly move my witness linear to the linears on the right right here, make sure I have the appropriate number of them have these m's right here so that every point I start with when I do this homotopy uh, satisfies the condition that this system vanishes. Uh, move from t equals 1 to t equals 0, and boom, solve that, solve that critical system. Um, so uh, 
You also need to have critical points on the critical curve. And um, for me, this is the most challenging step of the, of the program in the sense that I have nested determinant Jacobian operations. So uh, right here is the equation for the critical curve. I've got this linear right here to emphasize the fact that um, any points I get on it are going to come equipped with a linear as well, since they're going to be witness points. And in order to find the critical points of the critical curve, I've got to incorporate um, this beast into my system. So I've got to do a regeneration to, to this thing right here. Um, so it's going to be high degree. It's going to have a greater density of monomials than I started with. It's generally, um, generally unpleasant to, to try to solve that system. Um, so that's why Bertini is super awesome, because it's got the adaptive multiple precision and a number of other features that allow us to actually tackle stuff, um, which tends to be uh, nasty to track. Uh, so this uh, equation right here, um, to me, suggests the recursive nature of the algorithm if I wanted to decompose um, a threefold. Uh, and then I would have determinative Jacobian of determinative Jacobian of determinative Jacobian, which I don't think my computer is up to uh, solving. So um, we're going to have to find some tricks to get around this uh, nested uh, debt jack uh, condition. Um, so uh, the part that uh, has been super pleasant for me has been the 3D printing of my surface. Uh, in which I um, first run Bertini, so that gives me the witness sets. I run Bertini real, I get my decomposition, I refine it. Um, that's a separate uh, compiled program. Uh, process it through MATLAB into a stereolithography file. And because you can't print something that's infinitely thin, um, I've tried it and you just get junk. Uh, <laughs> let's, give that, let's give that guy some thickness. Um, I typically use the uh, free Python implementation uh, Blender to do that. And then I send that to a printer, um, which ends up being surprisingly hard. So I brought um, that particular decomposition uh, in the refined form today. I've got this. This came off of a MakerBot at NC State. Um, I've also got a copy of the Solitude, uh, which was printed on a uprint using a dissolvable filament um, so that we don't have nasty interface with the uh, support material. And um, I brought a little tray of Whitney umbrellas. So, yeah, you got to keep them. I actually want to print a really big one and like carry it around when it's raining at, at Notre Dame and see all the weird looks I get. Because it be, it's totally ineffective as an umbrella. Or maybe it'd be a good two-person umbrella and you stand side by side. Yeah, huh? Yeah, it would. If, if I could just get the dye from my pasta machine that made this, I'd be a happy man. It's pretty close to a bow tie. Um, so I brought about 20 Whitney umbrellas and... Uh, one little ice stute guy. Uh, so um, I'm giving a talk in about two weeks at uh, San Francisco State where I'm going to talk specifically about some of the issues with trying to print something that's impossible to print. Um, so if you happen to be at that um, conference, you might consider coming and checking out what I have. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much. Of the umbrella of smaller dimension, or you just pop out really without knowing it? It, um, it, it pops out without knowing it. So in in the step, let me let me back up just a little bit right here. So in the step where I obtained the um, the witness points for this, um, some of those witness points are going to have uh, multiplicity greater than one or be singular. I detect that, and I feed those points into an isosingular deflation algorithm. And I get a def different deflation sequence and a different polynomial system for every singular curve that appears as part of the surface. Um, this uh, surface right here um, is a four-dimensional surface, and it has uh, three curves of singularity to it, each having a, dif a different deflation. Um, so it, it's almost like magic that, that they show up. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm absolutely ignorant before I begin the decomposition that such a singularity exists. I just wait for it to appear when I find the witness points for the curve um, and then uh, feed them into this with a, a different f, uh, namely the deflated one, for each of the singular curves. You're welcome. Any, any other questions? Yes, uh, when, you, when you use the homotopy continuation method, so over, over the complex number, you have to avoid the, the discriminant locus, and you can because it has co-dimension 2 over the real. But if you work over the real, how you can avoid this discriminant which has co-dimension one? That's a that's a very good question. So, are are you most con which, which in which part of the algorithm are you most concerned about that? Well, this is a general question 
all times that you use a homotopy, yeah. and you have to care about this problem. So, so I, I <laughs> that's a that's a really good question, and um, my brief answer to it is that I stay in the complex world as long as possible. I just kind of hang out in complex until at the last moment I duck into the reals, and at that point I forget about the complexes. So the the answer to your question is that to obtain witness points. Um, I do everything over the complex numbers, so I have like random slice, random complex slices, and stuff like that. Um, so in the your initial objects would be complex. That's right. And you would drive them to real objects. I, I drive them to the real objects. Yeah. So, for example, in the step where I I do the slice right here, um, I I do that by moving from a a complex linear to the particular it looks like a real linear, but it's really a statement about the projection value in terms of one of the projections. Um, and at that point, I've only done that once, and then later, I actually do track on the real stuff. And that's in the step where I connect the dots. And it's a very special homotopy that's been constructed in that I, I track simultaneously on the top edge, the bottom edge, and the midpoint in a way such that I couple the two projection values so that I don't accidentally cross the boundary. Um, in terms of the criticality of the projection value. It's a very special homotopy, and it's, um, it's fairly time consuming in the sense that you're tracking like approximately um, five times the number of variables you started with, if not more. But, and that's, that's not if you're tracking on, um, on the critical curve. Uh, um, but, but I think also, also the but, way you, you, only go, you only go between these critical points. That's right. You avoid yeah. them by, by just your choice of not going to the critical point. Yeah. These, these two steps right here, if you get these wrong, if you, if you fail to pick up a critical point, then I'm going to encounter the problem that you're talking about. Because I'm going to try to track across a criticality or a singularity that exists, but I didn't know it was there. And then things are, are totally going to break down. And the decomposition has holes in it. And it's all jagged. And the program complains. Um, so it's, it's, it's sensitive to the choices that you make for the settings in Bertini. It's extremely sensitive. You have to choose uh, a higher security max norm if you're, if you're into monitoring the size of your variables so that you can quit tracking infinite paths. Sometimes things look like they're going to be infinite, but they're not. They're not going to be infinite. Those are just in the synthetic variables, and the, and the real ones are still finite. So it's, it's tricky. There's issues all over the place, yeah. Do you find is the best for doing algebraic varieties? Oh. <laughs> so I, I personally, that is a very good question, Maurice. I have, I have personal experience with, um, with one printer being the operator and with two being a bystander and letting an undergrad operate it for me. And the best experience I've had so far was on the uprint operated by an undergrad because it could print a dissolvable support, um, whereas the machine that John bought right now, I have a Lulzbot TAS 4, um, and we got it like three weeks ago, and, um, and I, I ask it to do things it wasn't designed to do. It's, it's, bridging's hard, man. Bridging's hard, and and trying to. I know we're over time. I'll, I'll, you should talk to me afterwards. It's, I'm very excited about it. Thank you so much. It's important that we get moving because I think Jam has a lecture. So let's.